Hey everybody, Arthur here. Welcome to another episode of the eShop closing coverage. If you haven't seen the other parts yet, I'll be linking everything in the description. Part 1 is focusing on 3DS exclusives, there are two videos on that, and part 2 on Wii U exclusives and hidden gems. And now part 3 is gonna be all about the virtual console for both systems. To me, the virtual console is wonderful, I love it, particularly on the Wii U, it has so much value, especially compared to what Nintendo is doing now with the Switch subscription model. You get to keep the games indefinitely, there are no fees to pay monthly or annually, you choose only the games you want without clutter, and there are so many unusual titles that were never made available digitally before or since, including from oddball consoles like the Turbo Graphics and the Game Gear. As well as systems that Nintendo has not included in the Switch subscription model at least yet. The Game Boy, Game Boy Color, GBA, Wii and the DS. Now, that's not to say that the Virtual Console is perfect, far from it actually. Uh, most people will be quick to point out some inexplicably illogical decisions that Nintendo made, most notably making GBA and DS games available only on the Wii U and not on the 3DS. And that was insane, I totally agree. I mean, I can see one reason for that, which I feel like most people forget, actually. They'll say that DS and GBA games look terrible stretched out on the TV, and that's totally true, but they forget that they are meant to be played on the gamepad. And they look great there, the gamepad screen is perfect for those games in my opinion, especially the GBA ones. But still, I totally agree that the 3DS would have made a much better fit, especially for DS games, of course. Now, there are hundreds and hundreds of games on Virtual Console. It took me a while to even organize myself on how to go about this. So here's how it's gonna work. First, I'll go through the most important games to mention. Those will be the high quality games that at the same time you may not be even considering whether because the games themselves are obscure or because people are not even aware that they were made available on the Virtual Console. In this section there will be 31 games this time. Then, I'll quickly brush through some of the more obvious games that are worth getting. You know, the AAA first party titles, mostly. There will be 24 games in this section, and I'll go over them real quick. It's just meant to be a reminder in case you forgot some of them. Then I'll go through the entire catalog of the two oddball consoles, the Turbo Graphics and the Game Gear, cause those are really lesser known and there are some surprisingly cool games there, believe me. I'll go over every single one of them, there are 33 Turbo Graphics games and 13 Game Gear games. And with all that we'll be going over 101 games, which is a lot but only a fraction of the games worth talking about, believe me. So I plan on doing two more of these. It's probably gonna be part 3 A, B and C, I don't know, let's see, but that's enough talking. Let's do the intro and go right into the games. Welcome to the channel, this is From The Void. Okay, let's begin with the great but lesser known titles. Let's start with a doozy of a title from Game Freak, but not Pokemon, Drill Dozer. This is an excellent action platformer, really 10 out of 10 fun and great game right here. You control this girl on a mecha with a powerful drill and how they manufacture the gameplay around the drill functionality is genius. It's hard to describe it, you gotta feel it for yourself, but basically the drill has three intensities and you need to press, hold, let go and press the button again again in specific ways to activate the different intensities. You do that to explore, advance through the levels, as well as combat enemies. It's a fantastic game, Drill Dozer, and it plays perfectly well on the Wii U. This is a must play in my opinion.
Next is a Game Boy game. And listen, if you carry any prejudice about Game Boy games, thinking that it is too much of a limited console in too many ways, I would suggest you put those aside. I also thought the same way until about 10 years ago, when I started giving a chance to some Game Boy games that I had never played before, such as Donkey Kong 94, the original Wario Land, Link's Awakening, The Frog for Whom the Bell Tolls, and this one, Mole Mania. This is an excellent, excellent puzzle game, produced by Miyamoto himself, really well done in every single way, including music, which is not something you would expect from a Game Boy game. You're listening to a Mole Mania track right now, how awesome is it? Everything else is also top quality, including the graphics for a Game Boy game and the gameplay, which is very challenging and engaging in all the right ways. You are mole dig holes to trespass obstacles from the underground, you can push, pull and throw many objects. It's a fantastic game, seriously, guaranteed fun for fans of puzzlers. Next is Sin and Punishment. Yeah. There are two games on this series and both of them are available on the Wii U. I am sure a lot of people don't know that and I know this for a fact because recently when Nintendo announced N64 games coming for Switch Online, everyone on Twitter was freaking out that Sin and Punishment was on the list like this was the first time it ever happened. They were like, this was a Japan only game, oh my god, this is the best value out of all games on the list, blah blah blah. And I was like, this has been on Virtual Console for over a decade now, first on the Wii, then on the Wii U. You can buy it once and have it forever. And you're happy because now you can pay for a permission to play this? That will end as soon as you stop paying? People are dumb, the dumb, dumb, dumb. Anyway, both Sin and Punishment games are awesome. They are on rail shooters with a lot of production value, where you can position your character on screen to dodge incoming attacks. The sequel Sin and Punishment Star Successor, also known as Successor of the Skies, or even Sin and Punishment 2, is even better. Now using the Wii remote to aim, which feels very natural and works perfectly well. These are some of the best on-rail shooters ever. Next is Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. Unfortunately, Tactics A2 was not made available on the Wii U, but at least Advance was. This is an excellent tactical RPG with everything you could possibly want from a game of this genre. Dozens of missions, a deep level of customization for your squad and units, well-balanced difficulty and progression, great graphics and a great story, and all that together makes the game entertaining all the way through while providing a great feeling of accomplishment. This is a must-play for strategy fans in my opinion. Next is Hidden Gem NES title The Mysterious Murasami Castle. This was a Japan-only game for the longest time that only came out to the West on the 3DS decades later. It's a top-down action-adventure reminiscent of Zelda but much more focused on the action, with fluid, responsive and fast controls. It still has the opening and name entry screens in Japanese, but this is absolutely playable for non-Japanese speakers. The progression is a bit cryptic though, such as were many games on the NES, so you'll probably want to have a guide handy for it. And this will require some trial and error until you get the enemy patterns and how the power-ups work. But the game is great, providing challenging but fair difficulty for the most part. This is an excellent NES title that has not been made available anywhere else at this point. Next is the Wario Land series.
every single one except the Virtual Boy Wario Land of course is available either on the Wii U or 3DS and in my opinion all of them are great and underappreciated titles. The first one is on the 3DS, it still carried the name Super Mario Land although Mario hardly even makes an appearance in it. This one is an original Game Boy game so the monochromatic visuals didn't age that well but the gameplay remains undeniably fun. Way before Mario Odyssey made a big deal about Mario's head powers, Wario was already doing it in his debut as a protagonist. The jet helmet makes him fly, the bull helm gives him super strength and the dragon helm breathes fire. <laughs> Freaking awesome. One thing to note, and this is valid for all games in the series, is that it's not only about reaching the end of the stage like Mario. There is much more of an exploration factor with stages having multiple paths, with some leading to treasure. Yeah, that's the whole motif for Wario. Hoarding treasure, getting rich, and to explore you will have to use enemies' attacks to your advantage. Enemies will burn Wario, turn him into a zombie, flatten him down, or balloon him up, and you'll have to be able to use all those status effects in order to progress. It's actually a nice change of pace for the platforming genre, and I wish they would make more of those. Wario Land 2, available on the 3DS, is also all about finding treasure, and they went crazy with the splitting paths in this one. There are several different endings, dozens of hidden stages, including a crazy difficult true final stage. Then Wario Land 3 is very similar to 2, it's also only on the 3DS, but with a nice world map to explore and each item you find in a stage can change the other stages, like turning night into day for instance. It's pretty interesting. This idea is actually brought from the original, but it happens a lot more in Wario Land 3. Then Wario Land 4 is the GBA one, so it's only available on the Wii U. It looks great, plays great, and has the best story in the series, hands down, involving nothing less than a new princess, Shokora. If you wanna know more about her, jump over to my top 20 obscure Mario characters list, link in the description. And finally, Wario Land Shake It on the Wii U was originally a Wii game and the first Wario Land in a home console. Unless you consider Wario World a Wario Land game, which most don't, and it's by far the best looking Wario game ever. It's impressive. It's also a lot of fun with all the great things I've been talking about from the other games, but now once you reach the end of the level, you have to return all the way to the beginning as quickly as possible, which is a cool feature. Man, I love the Wario Land series. You can't go wrong with any of them. They are certainly weird and unusual platformers with a lot of exploration in them, but excellent games each one. Since we're on the topic of Wario games, let's take a look at all the WarioWare titles made available on Virtual Console. The very first one was WarioWare Mega Micro Games, released all the way back in the GBA. This is available on the Wii U and it's an excellent title. The series started very strong with this entry, it received universal praise for its creativity, insanely high fun factor and addictiveness. It's very cool to have access to the original WarioWare on Virtual Console. Next we have WarioWare Touched, which was an original DS title, so it's available on the Wii U, and since the game is all played with the stylus, it fits the gamepad very well. This is kind of on the short side, but the micro games are as fun as ever. And finally, WarioWare Smooth Moves, which is a Wii original, also available on the Wii U. It uses the Wii Remote for very intuitive and creative motion-based controls, and it's a unique game because of it. It has the same problem of touch though, it's too short, but still worth picking up in my opinion. By the way, there is one DS side. WarioWare game if you want to have every single one of them, which is WarioWare Snapped, available on the 3DS. I will cover that in a feature video focusing only on DSiWare games.
Next one is not a great game, but I'm including it here just for the sake of having all Wario games together. I'm talking about Wario Master of Disguise. This is a side-scroller action platformer, kind of Metroidvania actually, and the problem here are the controls. They included way too much touch stuff in this, and since the game wants you to be holding the stylus at all times, they relegated the jump to the up direction on the D-pad or circle pad, and we all know that's just not right. Up to jump is for fighting games only. We all learned this back on the NES era. I don't know how they tripped on this in 2007. And on top of that, sometimes you're required to be fast in drawing shapes, but the game doesn't recognize your attempts well enough, which leads to frustration. It's a shame because there is a fun game underneath the broken controls, but unfortunately most people won't have the patience for it and I don't fault them for it. I think some critics were a bit too harsh with the scars on this, so I do feel like this is a underrated game, but not by a lot. A great game, this is not. Following up with unlikely vehicle combat RPG, Car Battler Joe. This is a really bold idea for a game. In its core, it's a car battle game, somewhat similar to Twisted Metal, but in a top-down view. You move your vehicle and shoot different types of weapons against opposing cars. But it's wrapped around a RPG structure with leveling up, talking to NPCs, changing gears to your car in the garage, exploring the overworld with cool sections of driving around between locations. It's all pretty cool. This becomes an addictive game right after you complete the tutorial missions and it's not that long lasting from 10 to 15 hours. In my opinion this is a hidden gem very much worth a RPG fan's time, especially if you're looking for something different. Next are the two GBA Fire Emblem games. The GBA era marked the formal introduction of this beloved and fantastic series of excellent strategy games, probably the best series of strategy RPGs in the world, to Western audiences. The first one was simply called Fire Emblem in the West, probably to convey the idea that this is the first one, even though it's actually the seventh entry in the series in Japan, and it's known there by the name Fire Emblem The Blazing Blade. This is the one that introduced beloved characters Lin, Hector and Eliwood as playable characters, and Eliwood, by the way, is Roy's father. Yeah, Roy is in Smash Bros, so he is more famous than anyone else, but he only makes his appearance later in the game. This is a prequel to the sixth entries in the series, where Roy is the protagonist. But anyway, Fire Emblem is a fantastic game. It does a great job at explaining how things work in the series, so it's a great place to start and was universally praised, receiving 9s and 10s all around. It's a must play for strategy RPG. RPG fans, and I include myself here because I haven't finished this yet. And then, right after that, we got Fire Emblem The Sacred Stones. This one follows the story of siblings Irika and Ephraim. This is not as well known as most other Fire Emblem games that made it to the West, because none of its characters made it to Smash Bros. This also received universal praise and is another must play. The entire Fire Emblem series is fantastic, and there is no other legit way to play these two outside of the virtual console on Wii U, and of course, the GBA physicals, which are much more expensive nowadays. And to close off the Fire Emblem section, we have Fire Emblem Shadow Dragon, which is the remake of the original game on the series. This was released on the DS and also plays perfectly well on the Wii U, in the gamepad or on the TV. This is a fantastic title. The level design is excellent, the characters are varied, including ballistic units that to my knowledge were never used again, and the story is also great. This one focuses on Marth, which we all know very well from Super Smash Bros. If you're into Fire Emblem games or strategy games overall, do not pass this one up.
Now let's take a good look at the lesser known Donkey Kong games. There are quite a few of them in the Virtual Console. And if we are doing that, we must start with a game known as Donkey Kong 94. The actual name of the game is just Donkey Kong, but to avoid confusion with the arcade original, people refer it by its release year. Now this is a Game Boy game and much like Mole Mania, which we talked about before, the fact that this is a Game Boy game factors in absolutely nothing to impede this of being simply a fantastic game, seriously. In fact, I would say that Donkey Kong 94 is one of those cases that use the limitations of the system in its favor. It starts off mimicking its namesake arcade classic and you immediately expect it to be just that, but then the game evolves and implements several ideas and mechanics that transform the whole thing into something truly impressive. This is when we saw Mario doing handstands to jump higher for the first time, a move that would be added into Super Mario 64 a few years later. It's also the birthplace of the idea ideas that would later become Mario vs Donkey Kong, with you being able to modify the stage itself directly by adding a bridge for instance, and on top of several of those greatly implemented ideas, the game itself is simply great fun. Each stage is very different, they are always adding a new enemy, or the need to move in a different way, there are keys to carry around, items to collect, it's all incredible not only for a Game Boy game, but for a puzzle platformer. This is among the best ever. Play Donkey Kong 94. I don't care how, this is a phenomenal game. Next is the Donkey Kong Land series. I bet a lot of people skipped on these games, perhaps thinking they are inferior parts of the SNES games, or maybe simply thinking they are not decent games at all. They are totally great platformers, and it's actually impressive how they managed to translate the same spirit of the Donkey Kong Country games into the Game Boy. It plays just as you would expect a Donkey Kong Country game to play, with the same fluidity and almost all the same moves. Each entry follows their SNES counterparts in many ways, including the theme of the stages and the playable characters. Donkey Kong Land 1 has Donkey Kong and Diddy, 2 has Diddy and Dixie, and 3 Dixie and Kitty. But the levels themselves are all different from the SNES games, so these are completely separate titles from the country games in the SNES. Very much worth playing. They even include the mounts. All three games are great platformers that hold up today, very surprisingly so. And next are Forgotten Donkey Kong Gems, DK King of Swing and DK Jungle Climber. These are really good looking, different takes on the Donkey Kong series of games. King of Swing came out on the GBA and Jungle Climber is a DS original. The gameplay in both is very similar to the NES classic Clue Clue Land, which is a not very well known game today, where you press buttons to have your character hold the pegs and rotate around them depending on how you're holding them. This gameplay fits the Donkey Kong franchise very well, as climbing is a natural ability of Donkey Kong. Instead of A and B, like Clu Clu Land, you use L and R to hold with each hand. This feels way more natural, frees up A and B to be used with different things, and you end up having no need for the D-pad or the circle pad, but you can also opt to use them. It's a very unusual control scheme that will trip you up, at least a little bit in the beginning, but feels very good once you get it. There is a good amount of challenge in these games too, and Jungle Climber is faster and includes more collectibles to find. Great games both of them, pick them up for a completely different gameplay, rare to find elsewhere. And finally, Donkey Kong Jungle Beat. This is a GameCube original, but the version on the Virtual Console is the one that came out on the Wii, with modified controls. The original was played with the bongos, while the Wii version is played in a more traditional sense, with the nunchuck circle pad to control movement, and the clapping is relegated to a motion with the Wii remote. Since the game becomes easier this way, they modified the levels to include more obstacles. People online are split between the two versions and control schemes, some prefer the bongos, some the Wii remote, 
which to me indicates that both are great. I only have the GameCube version, but I'm sure this one is also excellent. Following up with Hidden Jam, Kuru 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 Din. This is a puzzle game, I guess, where you control a forever turning beam and have to guide it from beginning to end without touching the walls, which is a very simple idea that actually translates to a surprisingly addictive gameplay. The visuals here are also a plus, and the level design is great with lots of added features to change things up. Nice little game for sure, Kuru 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 Din. Following up with the two Klonoa GBA games, we have both Klonoa Empires of Dreams and Klonoa 2 Dream Champ Tournament available on the Wii U Wii Shop. Despite having the number 2 in one of them, these are different games than the original PlayStation 1 Klonoa and the sequel in the PlayStation 2 Lunatea's Veil, vale, both of which, by the way, have been recently announced to be getting remasters for current consoles in July of this year, but the GBA games remain only available on Wii U digitally or in their very expensive physical forms for GBA, and these play just as well as any other game in this excellent series. The only difference is in the scenarios that lost their impressive 3D quality from other titles, but the games are loads of fun and excellent platformers nonetheless. Next are the two excellent GBA RPG fan favorites, Golden Sun and Golden Sun The Lost Age. This is a series largely forgotten by Nintendo that I hope comes back at some point, cause the story, characters, battle system, graphics and everything in between are all excellent in both of them. And you will want to at least play the two GBA games not only because they're fantastic turn-based RPGs, but also because they're closely tied together in terms of story, in a very unique way actually, which I won't spoil in case you're not aware. If you're into RPGs and haven't yet, do pick these two games up for a great classic style RPG time. Now let's start with the obvious game section. Here you'll find a lot of the big hitters that pretty much everyone knows about, but they are so good that I can't not mention them. This is gonna be rapid fire because I don't need to explain any of those in detail due to their fame, starting with the Metroid franchise. Let me be clear about this for a second because I'm pretty sure most people don't realize this fact. Every single Metroid game ever released so far, with the obvious exception of Metroid Dread and anything that comes after that, in case you're watching this later is playable on the Wii U and 3DS combined. Yes, every single one of them. In order of release, the original Metroid is both on the 3DS and Wii U, Metroid 2 for Game Boy is on the 3DS, Super Metroid is on the Wii U and new 3DS, Fusion, Prime, Zero Mission, Prime 2 are all on the Wii U, Prime Pimbo is not available digitally but as a DS game can be played on the 3DS, Prime Hunters is on the Wii U and can also be played physically on the 3DS, Prime 3 and Other M are on the Wii U, Federation Force is for the 3DS, and same thing with Samus Returns. And there you have it, all of them except for Dread. You can play all of those either on the Wii U or 3DS, and I think this is remarkable. But let's just concentrate on the Virtual Console ones, which is most of them. The original has not aged all that well, it's too cryptic for its own good, environments are too similar, you get lost a lot so you'll probably need a guide, but the game is a classic so you may want to have it. Metroid 2 Return of Samus, the original Game Boy game, holds up better than you think, probably. In my opinion it has aged better than the original, because this is a more linear game and the gameplay itself is just as good. Super Metroid is an absolute masterpiece, that's enough said. Fusion is an absolute masterpiece, enough said. Primes 1, 2 and 3 are also absolute masterpieces, the versions of 1 and 2, available on the Virtual Console, are the Wii ones 
with motion controls that I find great but some don't, you'll be getting all three in the trilogy pack which is a great deal. Zero Mission is a complete overhaul remake of the original with added parts including the final part, so if you're just looking to experience the entire story, go with this one, another total masterpiece. Then Prime Hunters, which is the lesser known of the whole series I feel like, but shouldn't because it's another fine game, it's incredible how they make a Prime game work on the DS. And finally Metroid Other M, I've only played this one a little bit so far to get this footage, so I can't say much about it, but basically the criticism it got was mostly about how it has lost a lot of the spirit that makes a Metroid game. But I'm liking it so far, the gameplay is completely different from the Prime games, but it's working for me so far, I don't know. And that's all of them. So yeah, you have several weeks of Metroid available in the Virtual Console, so take advantage of that before it's no longer available. Next are the more well-known Donkey Kong games, Donkey Kong Countries 1, 2 and 3, Donkey Kong 64 and Donkey Kong Country Returns. Countries 1, 2 and 3 are classics for a reason, they are some of the best platformers on the SNES, which is saying a lot, they broke new grounds in terms of graphics on the system and they hold up just as well today. Even 3, which never received the praise it deserved, because it's a fantastic game in terms of secrets to find and gameplay challenges with how Kitty bounces on water, this is the most impressive actually. Then 64 is a collectathon 3D platformer. I haven't played it since the N64 days, but I have really fond memories of it. I remember the exploration being great, but people say it didn't age that well. And finally, Donkey Kong Country Returns is a real return to form for the mainline platforming Donkey Kong games, a top-notch title from Retro Studios that is very much worth picking up today and provides many many hours of fun, especially if you go for the mirror mode and stuff. And finally, the Zelda games. There are no less than 12 Zelda games available on the Virtual Console. The original is an obvious classic, it has some of the same problems of the original Metroid, like being cryptic as hell, but has aged better than Metroid in my opinion, as the exploration factor coupled with the complete freedom to tackle the dungeons however you want remains fun today. Then Zelda 2 The Adventure of Link is better than you think if you haven't played it. This is one that is made much better with the save state functionality of the Virtual Console to compensate for some insanely unbalanced difficulty, especially in the the end of the game. Zelda 2 is a very unique entry in the series that I find really worth experiencing to this day. Then A Link to the Past is an absolute masterpiece of a game, and of said, Link's Awakening we have access to the DX version through Virtual Console, which is a colored version of the original with one extra dungeon, which is a pretty cool one, so it's worth picking this one up, and of course this was recently remade for the Switch, but I do believe there is value in picking the DX version as well. Then the two most famous, probably Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask, for the N64 are seen as some of the best games of all time, especially Ocarina, but my favorite Zelda game of all time is still Majora's Mask, even after Breath of the Wild, I mean. Of course, technically Breath of the Wild is superior, I realize that, but how Majora's Mask involved me is something that I will never forget. Then Oracle of Ages and Seasons, these are very ambitious games for the Game Boy Color, I enjoyed them very much. Each has a very different gimmick, in Ages you can switch back and forth between two time periods, with even the landscape changing changing between them, and in seasons you obviously control the seasons, which change the environments with snow and plants for instance. They are very intrinsic games, full of secrets to explore and there is a password system to carry some progress between the two, unlocking some important stuff on the second game you decide to play, which you can do in any order. Then the Minish Cap is another masterpiece in my opinion, it looks gorgeous with the GBA graphics and has some very unique mechanisms. Then the two DS entries, Phantom Hourglass and Spirit Tracks, I feel like I'm on the minority of people twice in this case, because I do like them very much both of them, where I feel like many people don't, and also because I prefer Phantom Hourglass to Spirit Tracks. They are odd entries in the series that's for sure, with most of the gameplay relegated to the stylus, but I found it to work well enough, not perfect though. And finally Skyward Sword is one that now has a version for the Switch, with some new features, but both are similar enough that if you wish to play the original, you'll have the same amount of fun and pay way less 
blast for it probably. Be aware though that this game makes heavy use of the Wii remote motion stuff and the final boss is a bit too difficult, putting the motion controls limitations in some glaring and frustrating evidence. Other than that, the game is excellent. And that's it for the obvious game section. There are several more to talk about, but I'll separate the games between the multiple videos. The Wii U Virtual Console, weirdly enough, is home to a good amount of TurboGrafx-16 games. Since the TurboGrafx is not very well known, and its games are hardly ever made available anywhere, I think it's important to feature them here. There are several of them worth picking up in my opinion. A good place to start is with the TurboGrafx mascot, this funny little bald-headed caveman here called Bonk, or PC Genjin in Japan, or even PC Kid in Europe. There are four games based on this guy, or actually three games and one featuring his future clone robot or something, but we will get to that. The three Bonk games are rather different platformers from everything you're used to, okay? So if you have never played them, know that there will be a sizable learning curve to overcome, mainly because these games are loaded with the unique features. The main difference here is how Bonk causes and takes damage. His lustrous bald head is his weapon, and his main attack is not this lame headbutt here, which is rather unreliable, you'll notice that very quickly, but rather jumping and diving headfirst into enemies. Since his head is the weapon, if you jump from beneath into an enemy above, you also defeat them, which is quite the opposite of what we're used to in all other platformers, pretty much. The second major difference is what happens if you keep pressing the attack button during a jump. Bonk will turn and turn endlessly, which inexplicably makes him fall way slower. This is another really cool feature that is hard to learn, because he has a weird momentum to control during this crazy ass maneuver. And the final aspect worth mentioning are the absurd power-ups. Anytime he eats meat, he becomes enraged and there are two different rage transformations. Other power-ups will make him tiny or huge, which Nintendo kinda rips off in New Super Mario Bros many years later, and even becomes a flat crab creature when smashed by a block, which Nintendo later rips off once again in some of the Wario Land games. Yeah, I'm calling you out Nintendo, I know where you got those ideas from. And soft. But anyway, all three games are awesome platformers. They really grow on you, and there are loads of secrets to discover, bonus stages, cool boss fights, everything you could want in a great platformer, plus a high level of craziness. Bonk's Adventure is the first one in the series, followed by Bonk's Revenge, and finally Bonk 3, Bonk's Big Adventure, which is the best one with more polish and longer stages. But all three are great, these are must play for platforming fans in my opinion. And the other Bonk game is Air. Zonk. Apparently Zonk is a future reimagining of Bonk, but they don't give us any details, so who knows. This is a solid side-scroller shooter with great graphics and really well balanced in the difficulty. Plus there are loads of weapons and power-ups, and you can even choose a sidekick to merge Zonk with, so you can try each one out to see which one fits you better. Air Zonk is another great game in the series, filled with fun and craziness, and another great reason for you to fall in love with this little guy. Next are the two Newtopia games. Those are famous, they are some of the first Zelda clones from back in the day, which granted the series a bad reputation for a long time, but today who cares really, especially because they are actually pretty good games. There's no need to explain how it works, right? Picture top-down Zeldas like the original or A Link to the Past, and this is exactly that, including bombs, the entire way the dungeons work, the whole thing. But everything is done competently, so the gameplay is fun, especially in the second second one where you control the son of the protagonist of the original, and everything is more polished in the sequel. These are today seen as two of the best games on the entire catalog of the Turbo Graphics, so a good one to consider getting on the Wii U.
following up with Shockman. It's a very obvious Mega Man ripoff, but it's kinda cool. Not as good as its inspiration, but a decent game. It also has side-scroller shooter stages to shake things up. Shockman's not great, but kinda cool actually. The Turbo Graphics became well known by its wide selection of great shoot 'em ups, and for good reason. Some of the best scroller shooters out there came out in this system, and one of them is certainly Lords of Thunder. This is a fantastic side scroller shooter where you control the warrior Landis, who has an armor imbued with each of the four elements. You can change them between stages, and you can tackle each one in any order you desire, like Mega Man. Lords of Thunder is one of the best classic shoot 'em ups, and a must have in your Wii U library if you're even remotely interested in this genre. Moving on to Datana Twin B. This probably doesn't look like much, but it's actually my favorite shooter of the whole TurboGrafx selection available on the Wii U. You can either shoot normal projectiles or hold the button for a much more powerful, concentrated shot, like Mega Man. And with the other button, you actually shoot a different type of projectile into the ground below where other enemies will be. This is so cool, it changes the dynamic of a shoot 'em up in a positive way. There is one caveat to this game though some parts of it are in Japanese so you won't understand the story here probably. But this happens only here and there, with no harm to the gameplay because of it. The Tana Twin B is actually a great game and if you're looking for just one shoot 'em up from the Turbo Graphics, this is the one I would suggest. Next is the Star Soldier series. Three games on this series made it to the Wii U. Super Star Soldier, Final Soldier and Soldier Blade. They are mildly easy top-down shoot-em-ups, power-ups are plentiful and devastating and it's not too bullet hellish, even in boss fights. One cool thing is that you can sacrifice one of your little helpers for a fantastic special attack that kills everything and looks awesome. These are fine shoot-em-ups, I enjoy them a lot, especially Soldier Blade which is the latest of them. Next is an absolute classic shooter, Radius. This is a side-scroller style shooter that may look very simplistic at first, but the power-up mechanism, however unusual, is a great addition. You accumulate the power-up currency and then you can choose which power-up you want. For instance, if you spend it right away, you get a speed boost, but you can accumulate 4 of them to exchange for the laser. You do this during the stages, it's pretty cool. Radius is a classic for a reason, this is a fine shooter. Blazing Lasers is also a solid shoot 'em up, this time a top down one, with a bunch of crazy power ups. There's nothing much to say about this one, it's just a solid shooter throughout. And finally, Salamander, in my opinion, is the weakest of the bunch. It's a side scroller style shoot 'em up, pretty standard, but the enemy patterns make it really difficult right away, so you'll need to learn each stage to survive without getting hit, as you need to keep your power up, otherwise, you're toast. It's still a positive game, but I found the other ones better. on to Chiu Man Fu. This is an interesting puzzle game. I had never played it before and was pleasantly surprised with it. First of all, it looks great for a game of this generation and stands out from the crowd immediately. Second, the gameplay is solid and addictive. You basically have to roll each colored ball to its respective tile. While you're rolling the ball, you can push the enemies. Otherwise, they would defeat you by touching you. This is a really cool game. It's nothing mind-boggling, but a guaranteed fun time.
Next are all the Turbo Graphics Bomberman games. One of those deserves a big highlight, by the way. Bomberman 93 brings the typical gameplay we are used to from this series. The stages are just one static screen with a bunch of enemies to wipe out. It's a fine Bomberman game if you like those, but nothing special. The better one for sure is Bomberman 94. This one is much more fun in the single player department. The stages are much more complex with actual level design to them, more varied enemies, you have access to kangaroos to mount on, which are awesome and give you extra health, and that's all on top of the regular Bomberman rules with the power-ups and all that. If you just wanna pick one Bomberman game, this is the one for sure. And finally, Bomberman Panic Bomber, which is actually a puzzle game. Not a bad one, but I wouldn't expect too many people to be interested in a Bomberman puzzle game. <laughs> I don't know, but it's a solid one of those, if anyone cares. Next is Dungeon Explorer. This is a classic top-down style action game similar to Gauntlet with really tough dungeons to crawl through. They are packed full of enemies trying to kill you. There are several RPG elements in this too, so many see it as a Diablo precursor. It's a nice game, it didn't age all that well, but still provides a good amount of fun. Next are the two Crush games, Devil's Crush and Alien Crush. As you can see, those are pinball games. The better one is Devil's Crush, in my opinion, because the other one was way too easy to get a game over at. I don't know, I'm not much of a pinball guy, but as far as I can tell, these are fine games for fans of the genre. Following up with Battle Load Runner. This is one of the lesser known Load Runner titles, but pretty similar in gameplay. You dig holes, avoid enemies, collect gold, and escape through a huge number of stages. I guess it's called Battle Load Runner because it offers a multiplayer mode, but I don't think anyone would be interested in this mode nowadays. The single player remains fun though, so if you're into this type of gameplay, this is a solid one to try out. Next is New Adventure Island. This one is new in name only. It's pretty much exactly the same as far as I could tell, but also fun in the exact same ways. You platform your way through the levels, collecting a few types of projectiles to help you out, and fruit to maintain your stamina, which kills you if it drains out, by the way. It's an okay game, but nothing mind-blowing. Now, since Turbo Graphics games are hardly available anywhere else, I'm also including the bad ones here, just so you know what they are. Some of them, I'm sure, are not even bad in quality, such as Necromancer here. With this one, Konami had the audacity to release it, and Nintendo the irresponsibility to allow the release of this text-heavy RPG to Western audiences without translating it from Japanese to English. Yeah. This is unplayable for 99.9% .9 of the audience probably, and I'm sure that a good number of people paid for this, then were unable to play it obviously, and are still cursing Konami for it, rightfully so. There isn't even a decent warning about it, which is even more aggravating. There is just this small text way in the bottom, where no one reads, saying that it may have foreign language. But all the way up here, it says that the language is English. I mean, what the f***? I hear the game's not even that good anyway, so stay away from this unless you really like RPGs and can read Japanese. Then there is the infamous China Warrior. This turned a lot of eyes with the huge character sprites back in the day, which was unusual for the time. And you can freaking punch fireballs out of the air, which is awesome. But this is a terrible, terrible game. The controls are stiff and awkward and the boss fights are a mess. Hard as hell in an awful and infuriating way. I do not not recommend China Warrior. Next is not Double Dragon, but Double Dungeons. Don't get those mixed up because this is a terrible first person dungeon crawler with no redeeming quality other than the fact that the battles are kind of fast, but it's beyond boring and grindy. And this is coming from someone with a high level of tolerance for those things in RPGs, so stay away from this one. Then the two racers in the TurboGrafx selection are unfortunately not very good at all. especially 
Lee Moto Rotor. This is a top-down racer, which is a style I actually like, but this one messed it up beyond any redemption. Mostly because the camera is always following the racer in the first position, whoever that may be. So everyone else is in danger of going out of the screen, which will happen inevitably and very quickly. And to solve that issue, the developer's idea was to push the cars falling away to the center with a magnetic orb or whatever this is. That's just a terrible, awful, horrible idea. Who came up with this? This is completely nonsensical. And once you get in this situation, you're done for, because you will never regain the necessary momentum to keep up with the other racers. This is probably the worst racing game I've ever played. Avoid Moto Rotor at all costs. And Victory Run is another experimental racer that didn't translate into a fun gameplay in my opinion. It's much better than Moto Rotor, but kinda boring for a racer. I don't know, maybe I shouldn't place this one in the bad game section, because I think there will be an audience for this one, because the idea here is to provide a lot more depth than we are used to in a racer of this era. You manage your car and each of its parts that will wear down with time, which is a nice idea, but translates to a kind of stale gameplay especially combined with the actual racers that are against the clock much more so than against other racers. So it doesn't even feel like there's a race going on. And I don't like how they made the rear view follow the topography going up and down all the time. I don't know, this was not for me. But if you like managing systems and a lot of focus to the tracks themselves in a racing game, you could find this one interesting. <laughs> Digital Champ Battle Boxing is just terrible. It looks like it could be a cool punch-out clone, it has some amazing character sprites for the time, but playing it feels like a completely mindless button masher, as you will quickly realize that the best strategy here is to just jab over and over in every single fight. They did a terrible job at balancing this game. This is a complete pass in my opinion. Next is Break-In. This is a snooker simulation game. I'm sure that for the time this was great, but now Nowadays, I see little reason to play this. I don't know. Either way, I am not into this genre, so I can speak much about it. And next is World Sports Competition. Ugh. I don't know. This is not terrible, but I can't see any reason to play it. Everything feels just okay in this game, it's very uninspired. I mean, for its time, it had a wide range of sports to try out, but today you will probably feel like you're playing a bunch of crappy minigames instead of one good game. I feel like gaming has completely moved on from this, so I would not recommend it. And finally, another title that has pretty much nothing to offer to gamers nowadays is Power Golf. Unless your heart car into golfing games, I see little reason to get this one, as there are so many games that do the exact same things with several extra features. It plays well and has colorful graphics, but it's too basic, nothing exciting. While the Wii U's Virtual Console got a bunch of games from the unusual console TurboGrafx, the 3DS Virtual Console got a bunch of games from the unusual handheld, the Sega Game Gear. And if you're rolling your eyes thinking that the Game Gear is too old and too limited of a system, let me tell you, I thought the same thing about the Game Boy and Game Gear until a few years ago, but I changed my mind after playing quite a few games that are simply excellent despite the handheld's limitations. And there are quite a few of those cases in this selection. And since these games are never made available legitimately anywhere, I firmly believe it's worth going through them. So let's start with Defender of Oasis. This is one of the few RPGs on the platform and a damn good one at that. It has great graphics for the Game Gear, the story focuses on a Middle Eastern inspired kingdom which is unusual and immediately interesting and it's a pretty well balanced game in terms of difficulty and pacing. Defender of Oasis is a cool game for sure if you're into quirky RPGs and can handle the limitations inherent to the Game Gear.
Next is a Shining Force game, which is one of the best old school series of strategy RPGs ever. And this game gear entry is also excellent. Shining Force, the Sword of Hagia. Similarly to Defender of Oasis, this hits all the right notes in terms of story and balance. While the gameplay is also solid, even though you will feel the weight of this game's age and limitations. However, this is more for hardcore fans of Shining Force, only because this game was remade for the Sega CD, along with its predecessor that had never left Japan, so most will favor playing the Sega CD game instead of this one. It's still worth a mention due to the series importance though. This next one I could barely believe what I was witnessing. This should have gotten a lot more recognition. It stands tall as a true Castlevania competitor, believe it or not. This is Vampire Master of Darkness. It's straight up the same formula as an old school Castlevania with a few differences. Mainly in the fact that you also have access to several main weapons, like a dagger, hammer, axe and sword. You can also collect different sub weapons such as the pistol, bomb and boomerang. This is a great game, it holds up even today and is a great addition to your 3DS library. Game Gear was home to a surprising amount of Sonic games, more than 10 titles actually, and several of them made it to the 3DS, which is great because many of them are pretty cool little games, better than you think probably. My favorite is for sure Sonic Labyrinth, this is in an isometric view, quite impressive for the Game Gear, and plays really really well. They nailed the gameplay on this one, you press the button to charge your dash and you have 4 speeds, with the higher ones being able to kill enemies, the objective is to find three keys hidden throughout the level, then find the exit and escape before your time runs out. There are power-ups and ways to increase your timer too. Every four levels there will be a boss fight, which are the weaker parts of the game, but good enough too. This is a great game actually, surprisingly so, and it holds up today as a fun game for sure. My second favorite Game Gear Sonic game available on the 3DS is Tails Adventure. This focuses only on Tails, which is pretty cool, and goes away with the obsession for speed of Sega's mascot, which is a nice change of pace, literally. Tails can use a bunch of items, like bombs for instance, and the level design and challenge are very interesting here. Too bad the sequel didn't make it to the 3DS. We also have Sonic the Hedgehog and Sonic the Hedgehog 2, which sound like but are not parts of the original Sega. Genesis games. They are completely different and rather fluid and solid platformers with the Sonic spirit intact. Excellent games both of them. They even have some unexpected sections like paragliding and minecarts, pretty awesome. Next is Sonic Blast. This is similar to the previous two, but not as good. The graphics are a bit more impressive for the time, the camera is a bit closer, but the gameplay is kinda stiff. The positive is that you can play with Knuckles here, which is pretty cool. The negative is that the level design is a bit lame, sometimes too easy and sometimes infuriatingly maze-like. Not a bad game, just not great either. And finally, my least favorite Sonic game available, but a very impressive achievement for the time, Sonic Drift 2. This is an 8-bit kart racer and those are very rare. 8-bit systems are not usually capable of running a racer with all the items and several opponents at once, but they found a way to do it on the Game Gear. But it's still a janky and very limited game. The turns are hard to predict and prepare for, even looking at the minimap, some pitfalls feel unavoidable, the AI is clearly cheating the whole time, there can only be 4 racers at once and you can only compete in 3 cups, so the game did not age very very well. It's impressive for the Game Gear, so a nice curiosity, but not too compelling for audiences today. 
Following up with classic puzzle game Columns. Now, I realized that there are several versions of Columns, including its sequel Columns 2, made available to more recent consoles. But to my understanding, this is the only time that the Game Gear version of the original has been made available anywhere other than the physical Game Gear carts. Plus, this game plays perfectly well in this version. I had only played it back when I was a kid, and I wasn't really the target audience for this, but now trying it again to capture this footage, I gotta say, this is an excellent game. Game. No wonder why it was considered Tetris' biggest rival. Up close though, this plays rather differently. This is a match 3 type of puzzle game and you cannot rotate the columns, otherwise they would not be columns anymore, right? So the game is aptly named. You can only rearrange the colored blocks within the columns. It's all about finding ways to make combos and keep scoring in classic mode or reach the flashing block to destroy it and win the match in flash mode. Pretty excellent game right here, this gameplay holds up very well to this day. Another famous puzzle game with a perfectly decent Game Gear version that migrated to the 3DS was Dr. Robotnik's Mean Bean Machine. It has not aged as well as Columns in my opinion, it feels too generic nowadays, but plays perfectly fine. So maybe if you have nostalgia for this, it could be a cool addition to your 3DS. Next is another interesting curiosity, G-Lock Air Battle. This is a first person aircraft shooter, very impressive for the Game Gear, that plays rather well. The missions are varied, you can choose to tackle them in any order you want and there is a cool shop in between missions to spend your points and improve your weapon, armor and much more. Pretty cool little game, again, nothing from the game gear will likely blow your mind but this one is a fun time for sure. Next is Crystal Warriors. Now gameplay wise this is actually an okay strategy RPG, especially for its time on the game gear, but there is a huge problem with this game, it has no story man, what the hell, an RPG with no story should be illegal or something. It's a shame too because the gameplay is surprisingly positive. On top of all the things you would expect from a strategy RPG, you can even tame monsters and use them in battle, adding a nice layer to the tactics. But the lack of story and the irritating music are big drawbacks here, so be advised. So there we have it, 101 Virtual Console games covered. With 101 games, this was the hardest project I've done so far, there was a ridiculous amount of research involved in this too, but I think it's worth it cause the Virtual Console is going away for good soon, and this was something positive, especially compared to what we have now, so it deserves to be chronicled as thoroughly as possible. So I would really appreciate if you could leave a like or a comment, and especially subscribe if you enjoyed this, and that way you can stay tuned for more as I plan on covering 200 more Virtual Console games. Not all at once, I'll space those out, and in the meanwhile I'll go over the DLCs and DSiWare games to get before the eShops close, as well as the other regular programming of the channel, including some new stuff, I'm working on some new things here. So stay tuned for all that, thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you soon.